For Chuck Wagner, making fine wine is a family affair. The Wagner family has been making wines in California's Napa Valley since 1915. Chuck's sons are now involved in the biz. He is the winemaker and viticulturist for Camus Vineyards. For many of us, Chuck is living our dream. He's sipping Cabernet, eating stinky cheese, and smoking the occasional cigar in the heart of the Napa. It is my pleasure to welcome Chuck Wagner to Studio 4 to tell us more. <laughs> Thank you, Fanny. A stinky cheese fan, are you? I am, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And if you were pairing stinky cheese with one of your wines, Ooh. which one would it be? Oh, I suppose a plaz and uh, came a special selection mm. Cabernet. Mm -hmm. So winemaking is in your DNA, they say. I know you're not 115 years old, so somebody <laughs> started before you. Yes. Who began it all? Well, I think uh, I actually have a lot of uh, family heritage uh, in the wine business in Napa Valley, on both sides, my mother's side and my father's side both. So really? um, my great-grandfather on my mother's side was the first winemaker in the family, uh, starting in the 1880s. Um, apparently made the first wine bottled under the Bullu label. Uh, on the other side, the Wagners came, uh, immigrated from Alsace, and mm. uh, planted vineyard in 1906, started a winery in 1915. That was my grandfather, Wagner, and he had uh, produced wine for about five years, and Prohibition put them out of business like so many families in the right. Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. So a little European influence early in the game. Yeah, and a little interruption. Little interruption, that prohibition. Well, some people say it worked. I say, I'm not sure about that. Mm hmm. So, uh, you, first time, who taught you? Your dad? Yeah, I, uh, basically, I was uh, just a, a kid on my knees. Uh, my father's uh, homemade wine, uh, bottles in an old prune box, and we'd fill them bottle by bottle and put the corks in by hand. And, and so my father was a, a very good home winemaker, and I, I learned uh, the, the original trade from him. Mm hmm. And when you were a little guy, did they let you sip a little at the table, or was it a no-no? Uh, like when you're was, 12. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can tell. Um, no one will arrest you. Well, no, I, I was able to sip wine. But I, mm -hmm. I think, uh, frankly, I didn't like wine until I was 17 or 18 years old. Uh, so I thought it was kind of bitter and sour and astringent. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the origins of Camus, of, of the Camus vineyards. Uh, uh, well, um, my father... What was there before? Okay, it was, uh, we're right in the middle of Napa Valley. Uh, the valley is about 30 miles long, three miles wide, and we're in Rutherford region, right in the center. Um, I grew up, my uh, parents grew uh, prunes, walnuts, and grapes, and my father was a home winemaker, as I stated. Uh, so by 1960s, uh, the prunes weren't doing well, the walnuts weren't doing well, so my father pulled the trees and planted grapes. And mm. In this case, he planted Cabernet Sauvignon uh, primarily. Mm -hmm. uh, by 1971, he was making home wine from those grapes, and, and the neighbors were, were telling my father, Charlie, we think you have something special here, and that maybe you should make commercial wine. Uh, so my mother and father sat me down at that time. I'm 20 years old, my father's 60, my mother's 57. And uh, the offer was, uh, listen, we would like to start a small commercial wine venture if you'll join us. Otherwise, we're, we're uh, contemplating selling the property and moving to Australia. Uh, so I, I, uh, I, I bet and uh, really just uh, stopped school, uh, mm -hmm. went to work pruning with my father uh, beginning of November of 1971. Uh, it took us four months to prune, and I learned to work with my father as a, as a fellow worker mm -hmm. uh, also. 72 was our first vintage year, and we produced about 250 cases of Cabernet. Really? Uh, it did well for us. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks so glamorous from the outside, mm -hmm. the wine biz, but when you talk about pruning <laughs> mm -hmm. and things like that, or what can go wrong, certainly I know in some of, uh, of your vineyards, if you have like ocean, uh, close, and fog, and strong winds, it's a little bit risky. Mm -hmm. Can be? Of course. Yes? Yes. So this one. Uh, let's not go to this one first because <laughs> okay. it's open and we don't All want right. the host to get silly. Mm. Uh, it's not a conundrum to me, but that is a fine wine, that conundrum. Tell yes. me about it. Well, conundrum uh, we began making in 1989. Uh, and really, I think the reason behind it was we wanted to gain some attention in the arena of white wine. We were well mm. known in reds. Um, we wanted to produce something different. We thought we would take um, the opportunities that exist in California and produce a unique wine. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by unique is and different in California is because uh, European countries have Appalachian controllees that only allow certain varieties to be planted within regionals, um, right. regional zones. And in California, we have no such uh, uh, laws or regulations. So we can, in fact, uh, say plant uh, 
Pinot Gris, one of the earliest ripening mm -hmm. varieties, right next to Cabernet Sauvignon. Now, that would be a mistake. However, there's no laws regulating that. Right. That uh, would so, be a mistake because? Well, because uh, if you did that, uh, it's probably going to be too warm of a region for Pinot Gris, and the wine would be low acidity and, and washed out. Uh, okay. And the Cabernet might be good, you know. So, sure. But, but my, uh, my point is that uh, without those regulations, we're able to use and blend different varieties. And Conundrum is Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Simeon, a little bit of Muscat, Canelli, mm -hmm. and uh, Viognier. And not only that, but it's grown in different regions, Napa, uh, Sonoma, uh, Monterey, and Santa Barbara counties. Mm. So it's, uh, it's a fine wine blend uh, with California tradition in that it uh, doesn't comply to European Appalachian uh, controls. Okay, easy for you to say. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, when you say uh, with California uh, tradition, what does that mean? Mm. I think uh, the, rather the American spirit, you know, is, is alive and well in, in mm. uh, California and Napa Valley particularly. Um, you know, whatever you think you can produce, you can plant uh, and, and just do your best at that. I, in the end, I think, after years of experimenting and making different wines, you finally find out which variety uh, belongs on which piece of okay, land in which it. climate. Mm -hmm. And as you know, in Europe, I think it's a little tougher. If uh, the grapes are not grown in France, it's not champagne. It's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Super Tuscan, uh, like any of your wines, or totally different? Do you compare old world wines and new wines? Mm -hmm. At all? Uh, well, we used to, uh, mm -hmm. Fanny. It was a um, there was a period when we actually looked to Bordeaux uh, when we produced right. our Cabernet Sauvignon. But right. uh, these days, it's changed. I think over the last uh, say two decades, uh, we've kind of gone off on our own. And uh, the style of Cabernet being produced out of Napa today is singular mm -hmm. and unlike uh, Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. And award-winning, I hear. I think so. Yes. Mm -hmm. So when you take notes with some of these wines, uh, what are some of your words? Mm, uh, with Cabernet Sauvignon, mm -hmm. uh, I would say its uh, texture is, uh, you know, be fine tannins, mm -hmm. almost chalky quality to it. I think that's always a sign of great wine. Uh, I like wines of flavor, so wines that may have some chocolate, uh, coffee, leather, tobacco. sorts of back tobacco. Would be Anything that kind but of old band-aids. Hopefully no band-aids. Yes. <laughs> no band-aids. That doesn't or dirty <laughs> socks or something like that. You yeah. don't want that. We've all had those. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. What what can go wrong? Uh, in the cask, in the oak, in uh, the stainless steel. Well, uh, what's uh, your fear when you're making fine I, wine? I guess one of the fe fears we all know is your wine can turn to vinegar. Um, oh, that. But beyond mm -hmm. that, um, there's a lot of spoilage organisms we watch and we monitor for. I think things have changed incredibly for the positive so that we can send in grapes from the field. We not only check the sugars and right. content, but we also can check for spoilage organisms to see mm -hmm. if we've got a source. Sure. Um, so more sophisticated So we're doing our now. homework, yeah, from the field mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. When you name a wine, when you name a wine silver, mm -hmm. how does that come about? <laughs> uh, not a label on it, but an, an interesting bottle. Yeah. Well, uh, silver, uh, you know, I think it's an appropriate name because this is a Chardonnay, 100% Chardonnay produced from Santa Lucia Highlands. Um, typically, these wines are, are barrel fermented and barrel aged, and they come out buttery and oaky and, and that sort of mm. thing. But Silver is uh, produced in cement tanks, uh, the same really? color as the bottle that the, the wine is placed. So and it's, you store it on its side and do all the same things? and All the same it's things. It's just a different bottle. That's correct. Well, you could put a candle in that one, I'm thinking. I think you could. Yes. <laughs> Might be a little tacky. but uh, So is this a Chardonnay? Yes, it is. Chardonnay? It's okay, and Pinot Noirs, beautiful Pinot Noirs. And mm -hmm. then this one, tell me about this one. Well, uh, you know, Cabernet is what we originally hung our hat on. Uh, we're lucky enough to have uh, the only winery to have won uh, Wine of the Year Award uh, by Wine Spectator twice. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we've carved out our own sort of niche as far as our quality and our, our character of our wine. Um, I like to think we have the keys. We know about how to produce Cabernet, at least in our style. We know how to grow those yes. grapes and how to make the wine. Um, but early on, my father was a, always loved Cabernet Sauvignon. It just so happens that I was born and raised and the winery was put on a place that is great for growing that variety in the middle of Napa Valley. Okay, would you like to pour a little? Sure. She says. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have the stinky cheese or the cigar, but it's a good way to start the morning, don't you think? I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, tell me, uh, you swirl either way? 
Either way. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Yes, you can do it on the table. You can do it in your hand. Mm -hmm. And how long uh, would, would you allow this to open up? Or is that a problem? Is it always drinkable? Oh, uh, I think that um, if you serve this wine too warm, I would mm -hmm. say that's a, that's a problem, number one. So uh, we have 60 degrees Fahrenheit. I really like to see the wines come to the table a little bit on the cool side, not refrigerated by any means. Right. Um, they can be poured right away and they evolve uh, in the glass. So as the, the ambient temperature brings the wine up to 65 right. and then closer to 70, um, the wine expresses itself and changes mm. and expands. And I think that's an important part of the appreciation. Sure, yeah, take me uh, down to the Chuck Wagner cellar. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have, um, I have a cellar um, and I have all of our old wines. Uh, I think it might be interesting to note that even though I have our oldest vintages of wine, I, mm -hmm. I enjoy the younger wines. Uh, for me, mm. this is a 2009 vintage, it's a real baby probably going to be best in four, four years from now, something like that. Right. Uh, and this how do you wine, determine that? You hear it all the time. That <clears throat> it's, uh, Drink that in, you mm -hmm. know, 2013. Don't drink that right away. Uh, right. You should have drank that last year. Wine mm -hmm. is subjective. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are those people uh, that like aged wine. Uh, and as wine gets older, it changes uh, quite a bit. The right. color drops and... There are some people who believe that you should be able to see your thumbnail through the glass of wine before you drink it, because as they oh. age and get older, they get lighter in color. Oh. Um, however, I like uh, the exuberance, the youthful qualities in this wine, and I like to drink it when it's uh, fully integrated and, and has become one, yet still has some of that, okay. that, that youthful exuberance. Okay, and you tell me, Chuck, does this wine have legs? This wine has legs. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. It has good legs, I'm thinking. And by that, it's this right here. That yes. I don't know if you, we can see it, but that's legs. Yeah. And why is it important or not? Well, it's, it, it probably is uh, less important these days than it used to be. It used to be considered a, a matter of quality because it's, uh, it's actually alcohol. And uh, so in a good year, in the old days, in a good year, you were able mm -hmm. to achieve uh, full ripeness, and that would give you legs. Yes. Uh, so most all uh, commercial wines that are high-end uh, like what we're producing, I mean, they all have legs. Sure, and so. they uh, taste mm -hmm. great. So International Festival Tasting, you're sold out for the Camus Vertical Tasting, you're sold out for the Wagner Family Dinner at the new Cactus Club. It's beautiful. Yes. Have you been yet? I have not. Okay, and the International Festival is uh, Chile this year. I bet you've been mm -hmm. to Chile, yes? I have. How great. Yeah, great place. Cheers. Cheers. Salud. Salud. What do they say in California? <laughs> Salud. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. How nice to meet you. Uh, Chuck Wagner from the Napa Valley.